anxious, not only in this book, but in our hearts and our lives as well. Ancient words. I'd like to ask a question first before we pray and get into the study. How many of you have this book and have read this book? 28 Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Doctrine. All right. Okay. Well, for those of you who haven't read it, I'm going to do some reading this morning because we need to be familiar with these doctrines because we're going to be tested on these doctrines by those that are not of the Seventh-day Adventist faith. So it pays for you to get this book. Please, if you want to know who really God is, this is, this is his second reputa uh, representation. You'll get to know God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, a little bit more deeper than what we got here. This is the Word of God. This is next to the Word of God. What Seventh-day Adventists believe. So I want to do a little reading this morning. And first, I'm going uh, to have you bow your heads and let's pray. Oh, merciful, loving, and kind Heavenly Father. Oh, Lord, in all thy wisdom, nothing is hidden from thy sight. Oh, Lord, the temptations that so shake our lives on a daily basis are well known to thee. And as we come into your presence this hour, we come to say thank you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, for never giving up on us sinners. We pray and we, we ask the Holy Spirit to show up. I've been praying this prayer all week that the Holy Spirit will show up today yeah. and touch the hearts and the lives and the minds of those that are here to hear the word of God, the doctrine of the seven-day Adventist faith. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be reading from the book, but I have it typed out. And I'm only doing the first eight fundamental beliefs. It starts off by saying to the reader of this book, listen up, folks, this is important to us. What do you, what do you believe about God? Who is he? What does he expect of us? What is he really like? Do we really know God? Get to know him, folks, as a personal God. God told Moses, no man could see his face and live. But Jesus told Philip that anyone who has seen him, Jesus, has seen the Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. Since he walked among us, indeed became one of us, we are able to perceive God, who God is, and what he is like through his son, Jesus Christ. Here's what the writers of this awesome book says. We have written this exposition for our, of our 28 major beliefs to reveal how seven days of Venice perceive God. This is what we believe about his love, kindness, mercy, grace, justice, benevolence, purity, righteousness, and peace. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, we see God benevolently holding children on his lap. We see him weeping as he shares the sorrow of the mourners at the tomb of Lazarus. We see his love as he cries, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, verse 34. We have written this book to share our vision of Christ, a vision that finds its focus at Calvary, where mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalms 85, verse 10. At Calvary, where he became sin for us, he who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We have written this book believing that every doctrine, every belief must reveal the love of our Lord. Here is a person who, here's a person with an unconditional love and commitment unparalleled in human history. Recognize that he who is in incarnate of the truth of truth is infinite, we humbly confess 
that there still is much truth to discover about our Savior and our God. We have written this book conscious of our indebtedness to the rich biblical truth we have received from the Christian church of history. We acknowledge the noble line of witnesses such as Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tynesdale, Calvin, Knox, and Wesley, whose advance into new light led the church forward to a full understanding of God's character. And that understanding is ever progressive. The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more until the perfect day. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Yet as we find the facets of God's revelation, they will harmonize perfectly with the united testimony of the scriptures. We have written this book with the guidance of a clear di directive, continually reminding us that if you search the scriptures to vindicate your own opinions, you will never reach the truth. Search in order to learn what the Lord says. If conviction comes as you search, if you see that order, if you see that order to suit your beliefs, but accept the light given. Open mind and heart that you may behold wondrous things out of the word of God. We have written this book to serve as a creed, a statement of beliefs set in theological concrete. Adventists have but one creed, that's the Bible and the Bible alone. Amen. We have not written this book to tally the imagination. This is not a spectacular work unless one considers the Bible to be that. Rather, it is a thorough biblical-based Christian-centered exposition of what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. And the beliefs expressed are not the product of a studious afternoon. They represent more than 100 years of prayer, study, prayer, reflection, prayer. In other words, they are the product of Adventist growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. We have written this book aware that some will ask if doctrine is really important in an age that finds itself struggling to survive the threat of nuclear annihilation, an age preoccupied with the explosive, the explosive growth of technology, an age in which Christian endeavor tries vainly to press back the brooding specters of poverty, hunger, injustice, and ignorance. Yet we have written this book with deep conviction that all doctrine, when properly understood, centered on him, the way, the truth, and life, and are extremely important to us. Doctrines define the character of God, of the God we serve. They interpret events, past and present, establishing a, a sense of place and purpose in the cosmos. They describe the objective of God as he acts. Doctrine are a guide for Christians, giving stability and what, are, and what otherwise would be unbalancing experiences, injecting certainty into a society that denies absolutes. Doctrines feed the human intellect, folks, and establishes goals that in, inspire Christians and motivate them with concerns for other persons. We have written this book to lead Adventist believers into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ through the study of the Bible. Knowing him and his will Amen. is vitally important in this age of deception, doctoral pluralism, and of apathy. Such a knowledge in the Christians, such a knowledge is the Christians' only safeguard against those who, like savage wolves, will come speaking perverse things in order to to subvert the truth and destroy the faith of God's people. This is mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, especially in these last days, to keep from being carried away with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. All must have a right concept of God's character. 
Let me say it again. All must have a right concept of God's character. Oh, boy, when you get into this, you ain't going to want to put it down. You're going to find yourself before the throne of God. Especially in these last days, to keep from being carried away with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, all must have a right concept of God's character, government, and purposes. Only those who have fortified their minds with the truth of the scriptures will be able to stand in the found conflict. I'm going to say that again. Amen. Only those who have fortified their minds with the truth of the scriptures will be able to stand in the found conflict. We have written this book to assist those who are interested in knowing why we believe what we believe. This study, written by the Adventists themselves, is not just window dressing. It's carefully researched. It represents an authentic exposition of Adventist beliefs. Finally, we have written this book Recognize that Christ-centered doctrine performs three obvious functions. First, it edifies the church. Second, it preserves the truth. And third, it communicates the gospel in all its richness. True doctrine calls for far more than mere belief. It calls for action, folks. Let me say it again. True doctrines calls for far more than mere beliefs. It calls for action. Yes. Through the Holy Spirit, Christian beliefs become loving deeds. Yes. Through the Holy Spirit, Christian beliefs become loving deeds. Yes. A true knowledge of God, his Son, and the Holy Spirit is saving knowledge. This is a theme of this book. If you don't have it, please get it. You'll fall in love with it. It'll be the best book you ever picked up besides the Bible. And now, I will get into reading the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. Everything that's written in the Holy Bible is doctrine, straight from the throne of God to us. The first, this doctrine is based upon 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verses 16 and 17, which Pastor just read. Found me on belief number one. Listen up, folks. The Word of God. Under each main towel, there's a subtitle. So I'll read the main towel first, our beliefs. Everybody's got a copy of it. You need to embed that in your heart and in your mind and walk with it, sleep with it, eat with it, contemplate on it day and night, night and day, till you get it down here and up here. Because we're going to be tested while you believe what you believe at Seven Day Adventist. Fundamental belief number one, the Word of God. The Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written Word of God, given by divine inspiration to holy men of God who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In, his, in this Word, God has committed to man the knowledge necessary for salvation. Amen. The Holy Scriptures are the infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the text of experience, the authority re revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. As for the general revelation, the insight into God's character, that history, human behavior, conscious, and natural and nature provide is frequently called general revelation. General revelation because it is available to all and it appeals to all. For millions, the heavens declare the glory of God and the front of it shows his handiwork, Psalms 19, verse 1. The sunshine, rain, hills, and streams testify, all testify of a loving creator. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. 
special revelation. Sin limits God's self-revelation through creation by obscuring our ability to interpret God's testimony. In love, God gave us special revelation of himself to help us, to get us, to help us get an answer to these questions. Through both the Old and New Testament, he disclosed himself to us in a specific way, leaving no questions about his character of love. At first, his revelation came through prophets, then his ultimate revelation through the person of Jesus Christ, his son. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible both contains propositions that declare the truth about God and reveals him as a person. Both areas of revelation necessary. We need to know God through Jesus Christ. As well, the truth that is in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. And by, by means of the scriptures, God breaks through our mental, moral, and spiritual limitations, communicating his eagerness to save us. The focus of the scriptures, the Bible reveals God and expresses, exposes humanity. Let me say that again. The Bible reveals God and exposes humanity. It exposes our predicament and reveals his solution. It presents us as lost and strange from God and reveals Jesus as the one who finds us and brings us back to God. Amen. Jesus Christ is the focus of all scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The Old Testament sets forth the Son of God as the Messiah, the world's redeemer. The New Testament reveals him as Jesus Christ, the Savior, every page either through symbol or reality, reveals some phase of his work and character. Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate revelation of God's character. It was God that came down from his heavenly kingdom on high in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, who knew no sin, but he died that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. The cross makes the ultimate revelation because it brings together two extremes. Man's unfathomable evil and God's inexhaustible love. What could give us more, what could give us greater sight into human fallibility? What could better reveal sin? The cross reveals a God who allowed his only son to be killed. What a sacrifice. What greater revelation of love could he have made? Indeed, the focus of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He's at the center stage of the cosmic drama. Soon his triumph, his triumph at Calvary will culminate in the elimination of evil. Human beings and God will be united. The authorship of the, of the, of this, of the scriptures, the Bible's authority for faith and practice rises from its origin. Its written views, the Bible as distinct from other literature they refer to it as Holy Scriptures, Romans chapter 1, verse 2. Amen. Sacred writings, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Amen. And the articles of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 2, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Jesus Christ, from my belief number two, the Godhead, there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and, ev and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension. Yet known through his self-revelation, he is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. Amen. At Calvary, almost everyone rejected Jesus. Only a few recognized who Jesus really was among them. The dying thief who called him Lord, Luke 23, verse 42. And the Roman soldier who said, truly, 
this man was the son of God. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. When John wrote, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him, John 1.1. 1, 1. He was thinking not merely of the crowd at the cross, or even of Israel, but of every generation that has ever lived, Amen. except for a handful, all humanity, like the rockerous crowd at Calvary, has failed to recognize in Jesus their God and their Savior. This failure, humanity's greatest and most tragic, shows that humanity's knowledge of God is radically deficient. Knowledge of God. The many theories attempted to explain God and the many arguments for and against his existence show that human wisdom cannot penetrate the divine. Depending on human wisdom alone, to learn about God is like using a magnifying glass to study the constellations. Wisdom alone, to learn about God, is like using a magnifying glass to study constellations. Hence, to many, God's wisdom is a hidden wisdom. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, to them, God is a mystery. Paul wrote, none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 8. One of the most basic commandments of scripture is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. When we do this, we're walking with God. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Deuteronomy 6, 5. We cannot love someone we know nothing about. Amen. Yet we cannot, by searching, find out the deep things of God. Job chapter 11, verse 7. How then can we come to know and love the Creator? Pick this up. You'll fall in love with God all over again. You'll fall in love with Jesus all over again. You'll fall in love with the Holy Spirit all over again. You'll love him so much as you you won't refuse to trust him with everything that concerns you. God can be known. Realizing the human predicament, God in his love and compassion reached out to us through the Bible. It reveals that Christianity is not a record of man's quest for God. It is the product of God's revelation of himself and his purposes to man. This Self-revelation is designed to bridge the gulf between a rebellious world and a caring God. The manifestation of God's great love came through his supreme revelation, Jesus Christ, his son. Through Jesus, we can know the Father. As John states, the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. 1 John 5.20 and Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. This is good news, although it is impossible to know God completely. The scriptures afford a practical knowledge of him that is sufficient for us to enter into a saving relationship with him. Amen. Obtain the knowledge of God. Unlike other knowledge, the knowledge of God is is as much a matter of the heart as it is of the brain. It involves the whole person, not just the intellect. There must be an openness to the Holy Spirit. That's another, that's another sermon. And, and a willingness to do God's plan, God's will. John 7, 17. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8. Found male belief number three, God the Father. The eternal, the God, God the eternal Father is the creator, source, sustainer, and sovereign of all creation. He is just and holy, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. These qualities and powers exhibit in the Son and the Holy Spirit 
are also revelations of the Father. The great day of judgment begins. The fiery thrones with burning wheels move into place. The Ancient of Days take his seat, majestic in appearance. He presides over the court. His awesome presence pervades the vast courtroom audience. A multitude of witnesses stand before him. The judgment is set, the books are open, and the examination of the record of human lives began. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. The entire universe has been waiting for this moment. God the Father will execute his judgment against all wickedness. God the Father will execute his judgment against all wickedness. The sentence is given, a judgment was made in favor of the saints, according to Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. Joyful praises and thanksgiving reverberate across heaven. God's character is seen in all its glory, and his marvelous name is vindicated throughout the universe. Views of the Father. God the Father is frequently misunderstood. Many are, un many are aware of Christ's mission to earth for, human, for the human race and, and of the Holy Spirit's role within the individual. But what has the Father to do with us? He is, in contrast to the gracious Son and Spirit, totally removed from our world, the absentee Lord's landlord, the unmoved first cause. Or is he, as some think of him, the Old Testament God, a God of vengeance characterized by the doctrine of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, an exacting God who requires perfect works or else, God who stands in utter contrast to the New Testament portrayal of a loving God who stresses turning the other cheek and going the extra mile, Matthew 5, 39 to 41. God the Father in the Old Testament the unity of the Old Testament, the Old and New Testament, uh, of their common plan of redemption is revealed by the fact that it is the same God who speaks and acts in both Testaments for the salvation of his people. Amen. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed to have all things, through, through whom he made the world. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Although the Old Testament alludes to the persons of the Godhead, it doesn't distinguish them. But the New Testament makes it clear that Christ, God the Son, was the active agent in creation, according to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And that he was God who led Israel out of Egypt, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. What the New Testament says of Christ's role in creation and the Exodus suggests that even the Old Testament often conveys to us its, portrait, its portrait of God the Father through the agency of his Son, Jesus Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. And now, fundamental belief number four, God the Son. God the eternal Son became incarnate in Jesus Christ. Through him, all things were created. The character of God is revealed. The salvation of humanity is accomplished, and the world is judged. Forever truly God, he became also truly man. Jesus the Christ. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived and experienced temptations as a human being, but perfectly exemplified through, righteous, through the righteousness and love of God. By his miracles, he manifested God's power and was a test as God's promised Messiah. He suffered and died voluntarily on the cross for our sins, and in our place was kneeled, was raised from the dead, and extended to minister in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf, and he's there now. Many, many people think God, the Lord Jesus, just 
just left us and went to heaven, but his work still goes on. He's our mediator. He's our high priest. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. And he's coming back for us. Amen. The incarnation predicted predictions and fulfillment. God's plan to rescue those who strayed from his all-wise counsel, according to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He conventionally demonstrates his love. He came and gave his life for us. And he demonstrated God's love for us as well. In this plan, his son was foreordained before the foundation of the world as a sacrifice for sin to be the hope of all, human, of all the human race. He was to bring us back to God and provide deliverance from sin through the destruction of the works of the devil. Excuse me. Sin has severed Adam and Eve from the source of life and should have resulted in their immediate death. But in accordance with the plan laid before the foundation of the world, <clears throat> the council of peace, God the Son stepped between them and divine justice, bringing the gulf and restraining death. <clears throat> Even before the cross then, his grace kept sinners alive and assured them of salvation. But to restore us fully as sons and daughters of God, he had to become man. Immediately after Adam and Eve sinned, God gave them hope by promising to introduce a supernatural enmity between the serpent and the woman, between his seed and hers. In the cryptic statement of Genesis 3.15, the serpent and its offsprings represent Satan and his followers. The woman and her seed symbolize God's people and the savior of the world. This statement was first, the first assurance that the controversy between good and evil would end in victory for God's son. The victory, however, would be painful he, the Savior, shall bruise your Satan's head, and you, Satan, shall bruise his, the Savior's heel, Genesis 3.15. No one comes out unscratched in that battle. From that moment, mankind looked for the promised one. The Old Testament unfolds that search. Prophecies foretold that when the promised one arrived, the world would have evidence to confirm his identity. They knew from the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that Jesus was coming. Yeah. From that moment, mankind looked for the promised one. After sin entered, God instituted animal sacrifices to illustrate the mission of the Savior to come, Genesis 4.4. This symbolic system dramatized the manner in which God the Son would eradicate sin. Because of sin, the transgression of God's law, the human race faced death, according to Second Corinthians, excuse me, according to Genesis chapter 2, verses 17, Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. God's law demanded the life of the sinner. But in his infinite love, God gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Amen. What an incomprehensible act of condescension. God, the eternal son himself, pays the penalty for sin so that he, might, so that he can provide us forgiveness and reconciliation to the Godhead. Fundamental belief number five, God, the Holy Spirit. God, the eternal spirit, was active with the Father and the Son in creation, incarnation, and redemption. 
He inspired the writers of scripture. He filled Christ's life with power. He draws and convicts human beings. And those who respond, he renews and transforms into the image of God. The Holy Spirit is needed in our lives on a daily basis, folks. I don't know how many times I said this, I'm going to say it again. We have to ask for him every morning. If you don't, the devil going to make sure you have a bad day. Sent by the Father and the Son to be always with his children, he extends spiritual gifts to the church, empowers it to bear witness to Christ, and in harmony with the scripture, leads all into truth. Through the, through the, though the crucifixion had bewildered, anguished, and terrified Jesus' followers, the resurrection brought mourning to their lives. When Christ broke the shackles of death, the kingdom of God draw, draws draw in their hearts. Now unquenchable fire burned within their souls. Differences that a few weeks earlier had erected nasty barriers among the disciples that melted. When the Holy Spirit filled them, they were ready for it because they sat there and they confessed everything among each other, forgave each other, hugged and kissed each other, and then the Holy Spirit fell fresh on them 12 brothers. And when he fell on them 12 brothers, they ran with the gospel. <laughs> when they knew Christ had risen from the dead, they lost all fear of death. They came into the picture to give their lives for the sake of Christ's righteousness. When Christ broke the sockets of death, the kingdom of God drawed in their hearts. Now unquenchable fire burned within their souls. Differences that a few weeks earlier had er erected nasty barriers among the disciples, which melted. They confessed their faults to one another and opened themselves more fully to receive Jesus, their extended king. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Bible reveals that the Holy Spirit is a person, not an impersonal force. Statements such as, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Acts 15, 28 tells us that. It reveals that the early believers viewed him as a person. He will glorify me, he said, for he will take a mind and declare it to you. John 16, 14. Scriptures referring to the true and the triune God described the spirit as a person. Matthew 28, verse 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The Holy Spirit has personality. He strives, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. He teaches, Luke chapter 12, verse 12. He convicts in John chapter 16, verse 8. He directs church affairs in Acts 13, verse 2. He helps and intercedes, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. He inspires, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. And he sanctifies, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. These activities cannot be performed by a mere power influence or attributes of God. Only a person can do them, and that's the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Scripture views the Holy Spirit as God. Peter told Ananias that in lying to the Holy Spirit, he had lied not to men, but to God. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Jesus defines the unpardonable sin as blasphemy against the Spirit, saying, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Right. Either in this age or an age to come, this could be true only if the Holy Spirit is God. Scripture associates divine attributes with the Holy Spirit. He is life. Paul referred to him as the spirit of life in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. He is truth. Christ called him the spirit of truth, John 16, 13. The expression of love of the spirit, Romans chapter 15, verse 30. And the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, revealed that love and holiness a part of his nature. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent. He distributes spiritual gifts to each, each one individually as he wills. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. 
He will abide with his people forever. John 14, verse 16. None can escape his influence. Psalms chapter 30, 139, verses 7 to 10. He also is omnipotent, omnipotent because the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, and no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Found belief, found, found me on belief number six, creation. God is the creator of all things and has revealed in scripture the authentic account of his creative power. In six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and all living things upon the earth and rested the seventh day of that first week. Thus he established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of his complete creative work. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crown and work of creation and given dominion over the world and charged with the responsibility to care for it. When the world was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of God. The Bible account is simple. At the creator command of God, the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them apparently appeared instantly, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. A mere six days saw the change from without forming void to a lush planet teeming with fully mature creatures and plant forms. Our planet was adorned with clear, pure, bright colors, shapes and fragrances put together with superb taste, the exactness of detail and function. Then God rested, stopping to celebrate, to enjoy. Forever the beauty and majesty of those six days would be remembered because of his stoop is stopping. Let us steal a quick look at the Bible's account of the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was shrouded with water and darkness. On the first, on the first day, God separated the light from the darkness calling the light day and the darkness night. On day two, God divided the waters, separating the atmosphere from the water, clinging to the earth, making conditions suitable for life. On the third day, God gathered the waters together in the one place, established land and sea. Then God clothed the naked shores, hills, and valleys, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in its, its kind according to their kind. Genesis chapter 1, verse 12. On the fourth day, God established the sun, moon, stars for signs and seasons, and for days and years. The sun was governed by day and the moon by night, Genesis chapter 1, verses 14, 16. God's fashioned the birds and marine life on the fifth day. He created them according to their kind, Genesis 1, 21. An indication that the creatures he created would constantly reproduce after their own kind. On the sixth day, God made the higher forms of animal life. He said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures among according to its kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth, each according to his kind, Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. Then the crowning of the creation, God made man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God saw everything he had created, and indeed, it was very good. Found mental belief number seven, the nature of man. Man and, women, man and woman were made in the image of God with individuality, the power and freedom to think and to do. Though created free beings, each is an individual unit, unity of body and mind and spirit dependent upon God for life and breath and all else. When our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon him and fell from their high position under God. The image of God in them was marred, and they became subject to death. 
their descendants shared this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weaknesses and tenderness, tenderness, tendencies to, to evil. But God in Christ reconciled the world to himself and by his spirit restores impenitent mortals the image of their maker. Created for the glory of God, they are called to love him and one another and to care for the environment. And as God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness God did not speak into existence his crowning creation. Instead, he lovingly stooped to shape this new creature from the dust of the earth. Earth's most creative sculptor could never crave, could never carve out such a noble being. Perhaps a Michelangelo could fashion a stunning exterior. But what of the autonomy, the physiology, carefully designed for function as well as beauty. The perfect sculpture lay completed with every hair, eyelash, and nail in place, but God was not finished. This man was not to collect dust, but to live, to think, to create, and to grow in glory. Stooping over this magnificent form, the creator breathed into his breath, Breathed to his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, Genesis 2, 7 and Genesis 1, 26. Realizing man's need for companionship, God made him a helper comparable to him. Here's the first surgery that ever took place on this planet. God caused a deep sleep to come over Adam, and as Adam slept, God extracted one of Adam's ribs, ouch, and made it and to a woman. Genesis 2.18 tells us this, verses 21 and 22. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. A garden, a garden home, more splendid than the finest on earth today was given to Adam and Eve. There were trees, vines, flowers, hills, valleys, all adorned by the master himself. Two special trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil were there. God gave Adam and Eve permission to eat freely of every tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, verses 8, 9, and 17. Thus the crowning event of creation week was accomplished, and God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. The origin of man, though today many believe that human beings originated from the lower forms of animal life and are the result of natural processes, that took billions of years, such an idea cannot be harmonized with the biblical record of creation that human beings have been subject to a process of degeneration is crucial to the biblical view of the nature of man. God created man. The origin of, of the human race is found in a divine council. God said, let us make man. Plural, us is plural, it refers to the true in God, the triune Godhead God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit of one purpose. Then God began to create the first human being, found in belief number eight. All humanity is now involved in a great controversy between say Christ and Satan, folks. Regarding the character of God, his law, his sovereignty over the universe, this conflict originated in heaven when a created being endowed with freedom of choice. In self exaltation became Satan, God's adversary, and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disordering of the created world. 
and its eventual devastation at the time of the worldwide flood. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universe, of the universal conflict out of which God, out of love, will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in this controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide us, protect us, and sustain us in the way of salvation. Scripture portrays a cosmic battle between good and evil, God and Satan. Understand this controversy, which has involved the entire universe, helps answer the question, why did Jesus come to this planet? And I'll jump to following I believe, number 10. The experience of salvation. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need, acknowledge our sinfulness, repent of our transgressions, and exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as substitute and example. This faith which receives salvation comes through the divine power of the word and is the gift of God's grace. Through Christ, we are justified, adopted as God's sons and daughters, and delivered from the lordship of sin. Through the spirit, we are born again and sanctified. The spirit renews our minds, writes God's law in our hearts, and we are given the power to live a holy life. Abiding in him, we become partakers of the divine nature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the judgment. Throughout scripture, the descriptions of the believer's experience, salvation, justification, sanctification, purification, and redemption are spoken of as one, already accomplished, two, presently being realized, and three, to be realized in the future. And understanding of these perspectives help to solve the seeming tension and emphasis related to justification and sanctification. And now, before I come to a close, there's something the Holy Spirit has paid for my heart to share with you brothers and sisters today. If you're tired of being disappointed about not having a prayer answered, think on this wise. Are we putting faith behind our prayers? Are we applying faith in God behind our prayers? Let me give you an example of the faith that we use on a daily basis. How many of you have ever ordered something from Amazon or through the mail? Hmm? Watch this. When you make that phone call and they say, Amazon, what can I do for you? Hey, I'd like to order this product or that product. And they'll tell you how much it is. They'll tell you a little bit about the product. Then they'll take your credit card number, your phone number, your name, your address. And they say it'll be there in such and such a days. What do we do after that? We wait. Because we know we pay for that product and it's coming. Well, folks, it's the same thing when you lift up prayer to God. Amen. We have to wait and expect it. We don't just pray and get on our knees and, and that's it. God is waiting for us to expect something from him. Yes, and people all the time crying about, I need more faith. You don't need no more faith. God said, I'm giving them faith and they're asking for more. They haven't used what I gave them. So when you, when you get on your knees and ask God for something, make sure that it's something God wants you to have. And then what you do next, you wait on it. You wait on it, you thank God, and you look for it, you expect it. We don't do that when we pray. We just pray and get up off our knees and thank God when I say a prayer, and he's not a Santa Claus God. He'll give us what we ask for, folks, if it's according to his will for us to have Solomon was a very good example. A young boy told God he liked to have wisdom 
to lead his people. So when we ask God for something that's going to give God glory, God will answer that prayer. If we look on it, Jesus said, watch and pray. So you pray for something, watch for it, expect it, look for it, and he'll give it to you. That's how you get your prayers answered when God is involved in that prayer of unselfish asking. And now I'll come to a close. There are four things I'd like to tell you. There are four things I'd like to tell you, my brothers and sisters. Never give up. Never give up. Never get in, give in. And certainly never stay down. Every person, to every person, I don't know whether you were born and raised as a believer at Seven Days Adventist or you never heard the gospel, but I know that there comes a time when you feel the urge to want to give up. That urge may be given up, that urge may be given up on your marriage or on your career of ambition or perhaps on your walk with God. You may feel like you've hit dead, dead end. You may feel like you're the last soldier standing on the battlefield and your enemy is still marching forward. I want to simply encourage you today, folks. Never give up. Not even for a second. Imagine for a second the image. Imagine for a second. Imagine if the roles we were if the roles we were in, wait, let me get this right. Imagine for a second. Imagine if the roles were switched and God were to give up on us. Imagine if we said, if God said to us, you failed me too many times. You sinned too many times. You've fallen short too many times. Thank goodness it isn't that case. The good news is that the good Lord would never give up on either one of us. Amen. He paid too much of a price with the life of his precious son Amen. to give up on us now. He know where he brought us from. We know where he brought us from. And it's too late in the game to give up and quit now, folks. Amen. Thank goodness this isn't the case. Understand that God is always good. He's always faithful. He feels our pain, and he wants to lift our burdens. He gives us strength when we think we can't. We can trust God. We can cast our cares on him. We can choose to place our faith and hope in him because he loves us so deeply. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. And we've come too far now to sell out. I'm not going to let anything cost me my salvation. Praise Nothing. God. There's too much investment in each one of us. Now, there's no saying that goes like this. Winners never quit and quitters never win. Let us stand and commit our surrender to the Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, when we feel like our lives have hit rock bottom, please don't forget us. That Jesus invites us to come unto him, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and he will give us rest. Let us remember our, Savior's, our Savior told us that if we come to him, we can lay all our burdens on him, and that if we Take his yoke upon us. Tell somebody about Jesus. That's the yoke that he tells us to take upon us. Telling somebody else about the great plan of redemption and what he's done for us. Then he'll put his rest in our hearts, in our souls. Now, Lord, as we surrender our lives full of you, in thy unchanging hands, we expect your peace and your rest to keep us from falling. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, and thank God. Amen. Get this book, folks, please. Money in gold. Get this book.
You want to see who God really is? Get this book. 